Dory. Let's go to well. a 509 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. This is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. How are you, sir? Good. Um, I speak Spanish, and I'm working on a Maoist Christina Kirchner impression. So, <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> you up for a commute? Are you up for a cross-country commute? Bernie or bust Emiliano Zapata? Uh, that actually okay. sounds amazing. What do you um, think of Christina? What was I going to say? So uh, I think that you, um, your your broader point is still correct, even though there's some good immigration plans, which is that the Democrats need to coalesce around um, something that is easy to communicate and uh, some points that aren't quite so technical. Um, right. Even with uh, Castro... He seemed really focused uh, focused on <clears throat> this idea of decriminalizing uh, unlawful entry, and that's really small bore. It doesn't. Well, the problem is too act- is it, it it allows for a lot of exploitation of these folks when they get here. Uh, sure. I mean, so th- they used. It's true that they used uh, strict enforcement of that misdemeanor law to separate. Uh, families uh, for a while last year, and then they stopped doing it. So they, they're not strictly enforcing that law anymore. Now, you should still get rid of it, but he had two debates um, where he had the opportunity to go out and, and really, you know, communicate something. And he chose to, to lean on that one aspect of his plan both times. And if you were to re- repeal that law, it would be good. I'm not saying it's not, but it would also fix virtually nothing. Right. Um, so um, they're saying, well, it should be a civil offense. Well, that's how it's treated 99% of the time already. Um, and and so and, and as the administration is showing, uh, there's other cool ways to separate families. Uh, you don't necessarily need uh, this m- misdemeanor law. So, uh, yeah, he he has a pretty good plan and some good ideas, but I think he he failed um, to communicate effectively what the plan is. And the problem is, like you mentioned the other day, most people kind of want to just ignore this. They don't really want to think about it too hard or, or very often, um, except for the people who feel really, really strongly the other way. And so I right. don't know. I, I think that's a similar, know to be honest with you, I think that's a similar dynamic with guns. I, I mean, I think that like, yeah. I think when there are particular instances that offend the sensibilities, people are like, I don't want that. But they're not right. willing to sort of subscribe to some broad, um, you know, the, the idea of like, we're not going to prevent anybody from coming in and being a citizen. They just they would rather right. hear we're going to have a humane and just policy and then just sort of walk away and say, like, yeah, you guys take care of the details, um, as opposed to something more specific of like, we're just we're simply going to let everybody we're going to have a procedure for it. We're going to have, you know, maybe, um, uh, you know, some ki- criteria where we will, uh, you know, where five percent of people we will turn away. I'm, I'm, I'm saying an arbitrary number, but, you know, some percentage of people we're going to turn away. But uh, broadly speaking, the vast majority of people who want to come become citizens will become citizens. Um, I think uh, what I would say is that we want the immigration plan that exists already in the minds of most Republicans, which is if you're here and you work hard and you're a good person and you can pass a background check, you should be able to get in line and legalize your status. And the problem is that's what most people think exists, but it does not exist. And so right. we want to put in place the plan that you imagine exists already, but doesn't. And um, because people... Right, this whole concept assume, of like, get in line. Why are you jumping ahead of line? You know, the whole line concept seems to be a sort of a fantasy plan that exists. Right, and it makes sense that if, if there was a line that you could go and get into, you could go down to the paper store and, and sign up and get a green card. It would make sense to, to be really opposed to illegal immigration 
because you know all you got to do is go down and do the thing and and then you'd have papers and if you don't there must be some nefarious reason but like all of that is based on a faulty premise so that's kind of how i would try and frame it um i wanted to ask you one quick question and then i'll jump um i've been thinking a lot about my time as a mormon missionary i'm a former mormon as i've mentioned before and how uh it's not an easy thing to sell mormonism because it's super weird um really but there yeah. Did you when have? You did I already ask long, you this? Did you have that like um, the animated uh, book of, that explained how the angel came down to uh, Smith? Guys, I know it's weird, but you get to bang a bunch I, of girls on when, your own mood. When I <laughs> think about it, when I when I there, was a kid, a, when I was a kid, there is a pretty strong payoff on the back end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, yeah. I was traveling through, uh, Europe at one point and whenever I would meet Mormon missionaries, I would spend a lot of time talking to them. And I saw that book they had like the animated version, um, uh, multiple mm-hmm. times. Did you, did they give you those or, or this was way before your time? No, we, I mean, I had those growing up, but I, no, we didn't have those on my mission. But, uh, the, the point is, um, you know, we had to think a lot about how to communicate to people and how to uh, sort of uh, recognize their concerns and all these sorts of things. Uh, we would also get into debates with like Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, right. It was like a scene from uh, uh, West Side Story, you know, yeah. a couple of Mormon missionaries. And so anyways, those types of contentious encounters always left both sides leaving more emboldened, I think, in their own dumb beliefs um even if like objectively you lost the debate i don't know that you can really lose or win a debate amongst those two groups but right. even if they scored most of the points you would come away feeling more mormony than you had going into it so it, it really was not an effective way of of communicating or trying to uh, win hearts and minds and i wonder if uh, this is not a function of Bernie Broism, but onlineism. If we need to start thinking more strategically about how we communicate, um, it seems like online the goal is to people see themselves not as missionaries of of an idea or like trying to win hearts and minds, but you know we're all trying to score points or uh, you know get a big dunk on somebody. And sometimes that's important when when there's bad faith actors or people you're not never going to win over anyways. But I see a lot. I do see a lot of hostility, uh, hashtag online, uh, between sort of like leftist purists and people who are maybe more century or people who just care less about politics. And it, it seems like that's that is harmful and it is a real phenomenon. And maybe like it's you know, maybe we need to have a conversation about how to engage with those people. And I I think especially, this is the last point, then I'll go, you know, the idea behind Bernie being the best candidate is he's going to lead this grassroots movement and he's going to bring in more people to the fold. And that's going to be really hard to do if there's a sense that uh, people who are coming into this for the first time and they're maybe not as woke or they're not as informed if fluent. they're going to be met with uh, hostility and dunking and that sort of thing, rather than a sense of community, so yeah, I don't I know. Mean, on your on, on your latter point, like you know, it's it's hard for me to, to get a, a full on assessment of this because um, uh, you know I it's sort of just the waters I swim in. I mean, I think the analogy of your sharks and jets with the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons for me, the issue isn't what the players thought the issue is the people who gathered around you and listened and what they thought i mean that's uh that's you know i mean i'm in a business where uh and i entered into this business as a performer and so i'm simply conscious of the audience and um i think i think there is you know i i don't I, I can't make really any broad assessments about the way that people are fighting or who's fighting online but i can say that like people should enter into these exchanges um with a broader audience in mind and be conscious of how it's received by other people 
Man. And I think that will that will you know go a long way to saying like what's the value of me uh, dunking on this person? I and, and I say this as someone who believes in very specific instances that there are is a lot of value on it of of it. Um, but you have to be aware that the the what you're doing has no value in terms of the individual you are um, you're 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 engaging with if you're engaging in that way. I th uh, I think that that's a, I like that he made the distinction though because I think there's a much broader point about online ism in general and how it actually bleeds really destructively into even sort of like quote them you know real life spaces and I always recommend in the kind of family of that there's always the vampire castle essay which is great but I I think that on the flip side and I was actually just talking with Hassan Piker about this like there also needs to just be more comfort with people disagreeing with each Conflict, other. And yeah. just because people disagree and have debates, especially among people that you sort of share a set, like, you know, I've had, uh, you know, friendly disagreements with uh, people. I have nothing like the, the highest respect for on, as an example, like, you know, some of the intricacies of really establishing the distinction between Sanders and Warren, as an example. I think that's actually an important debate. And I think there's real substantive differences there. And none of those arguments or debates have led to like, <laughs> I still really like and respect these people. We still work together. Like that, that's, that's the, that's sort of the paradox is, is like it really all or nothing, like either total destruction in a way that's extremely alienating i think to normal people or on the other hand just some idea that like unless we're just always synchronized we can't have disagreement and that's just not true i mean disagreement can be healthy and it's totally normal and totally fine